Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss, Kaylin Carr. Oh, it feels like we haven't been together in a while, guys. Am I wrong about that? Am I imagining that? The world is a blur and I, I might be completely... Off here, no, it feels, the, I think you're. I think you're like right. Kalen was maybe gone for a while, yeah. and then like Dave was gone, or somebody was. I don't know, but we're back together. It feels good. Week five in the books, the World Cup draw in the books. We haven't talked about that at least on this show. Go check out all the coverage at MLSsoccer.com and the MLS YouTube page, of course, for all of those uh, who tuned in, and there were tens of thousands of you <laughs> to see what Demarcus Beasley's, Matt Doyle's, and Kalen Card's thoughts on that draw, as well as Susanna's were. Uh, thank you. We're back on Wednesday, by the way, for another watch along. We've been talking about this for a long time. CCL, it is our brand. It butters our bread. <laughs> we will be with you for that NYCFC Seattle Sanders game in Seattle from Lumen Field on Wednesday. Charlie, Doyle, Kalen, myself, uh, come join us. Come hang out. We'll talk about anything and everything under the books. Uh, you're back from Costa Rica, Dave. Yeah. How was it? Oof. It was everything I've always dreamed of. Obviously, grew up watching CONCACAF. I've never been to a game in Central America before, and it was... Really? Yeah. I will... That yeah, is... Mexico I, I, that's honestly... North, sh- that's surprising. Mexico yeah. counts as North America, right? North, yeah. yeah, it's not yeah, Central America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've never yeah. been to a that's, game in Central America geography. before. Yeah. yeah. That's geography for you. <laughs> you know? So it was, it was epic. I mean, a lot of times I'm covering them from here, so it's hard to go. Um, and it was everything, man. And listen... There, things could have been different, and I was a little upset going down. Like, ah, it doesn't count for anything. But it was actually really nice to not be that nervous and sort of be cheering with the Costa Ricans as they played well. Um, it was weird the last 10 minutes when everyone sort of recognized that everyone collectively was like, we're not going to get out of this game what we want, right? Costa Rica wasn't going to win 6-0. We weren't going to win. And so everyone kind of just the last 10 minutes sat there. But then Kaylor Navas did a, did a lap of honor. Uh, and it was pretty sweet, and it's epic. I was there for three, four days after, and let's say 50% of people just wear Costa Rica Ticos jerseys, like, all the time. It's just the outfit of choice throughout the country, and that's dope. I'm going to veer off script I, already. I, oh, it, let me go. just ask this. So, David, in in your lifetime of watching mm-hmm. CONCACAF soccer and CONCACAF soccer players, is Kaylor Navas the best player in the region's history? He's definitely the best goalkeeper. I feel safe yes. saying that. Is he the best player in the region's history? Wow. And just uh, in your lifetime. Just yeah, yeah. like Hugo Sanchez is the other contender. Yeah. I, right now, I think it's a, it's a one-two with those two guys. And, and would Dwight York be the you, last really. part of that convo? Dwight York. Is, so I, I think the next tier is like Landon, Dwight York, uh, El Magico, you know, the, yeah. the great – Salvadoran number 10 from which was before my 80s, lifetime <laughs> which was before your lifetime right Rafa Marquez you could okay. put Clinton there you know yeah. me I, I, it's not it's less rankings and more tiers with me yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think that tier, first yeah. tier like what what Kaylor Navas did to get Costa mm-hmm. Rica into the fourth place game they took 19 of 21 points over the final seven games it, it was He's he's just absolutely and all all the XG basically says Panama outplayed them except Kaylor Navas, which yeah yeah, it was amazing. It was there. I think we've all seen these moments, whether it's in a market like one player in one city or a country where like a player means more. And Kaylor Navas is he's president of that country, and like you could feel it in the chance pregame. You could see it in the jerseys. Where else do you go where a bunch of people own goalkeeper jerseys? And then when he went off hurt, it was like probably the loudest cheer. Uh, of the night, including the goals. So, yeah, I, I feel comfortable putting him in there. I mean, once you win X amount of Champions League as a starter, I think you're you're pretty much yeah, there. For sure. Can we add Alfonso Davies Soon. to that list then? <laughs> He'll be Soon. close. At some Soon. point. I swear, though, I thought I saw Goss in the crowd at a CCL match with the Dynamo in Panama <laughs> City in 2011. That wasn't you? Me at, at Chirillo or San Francisco? Who was playing? <laughs> I can't believe this. Your first trip, man. Listen, I look Simon. very much like Jaime. Me and Jaime Pinedo look alike, so all his family probably looks like me. So if he was there, then maybe it looked like I was there. Rabi Unido? Which one was it? I, I don't know. Unido, I don't know. Probably, uh, yeah. By the Rise. way, we are not going to do a sky hit. Speaking of uh, the international game today, there's no sky hit today. 
uh, with Kalen, and, and you know we look forward to hearing what they're asking about. The running scared, Kalen. The English oh, yeah. are running scared. They, they don't, don't even want this. Br- they, they don't want to broach don't even the it. possibility, the topic, that somebody might come on their channels and tell them, this is not easy, you might lose this game. Do you remember that draw? Hashtag Robert Green. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, it's good. We want to be overlooked right now, you know, and that includes even our little media hits right now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> They were just going to ask about Phil Neville anyways. Yeah, they're, they're... That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be a short show, a short hit for you. Yeah, ain't nobody want to talk about Phil Neville. Uh, all right, coming up today from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, the best thing we saw in MLS Week 5, of course, talking El Trafico. Maybe the two best games, the best results of the weekend came from the L.A. teams next Saturday. The first El Trafico. Knock on wood, knock on wood. Please survive training this week. Chicharito and Carlos Vela when those two will play against each other. 7.30 p.m. Eastern Saturday, Big Fox, Fox Deportes. Going to talk through that one. We will talk about the wild game. And Cincy, who lost that? Oh, Cincy lost that. Montreal getting a 4-3 win. Philadelphia Union atop the Eastern Conference right now. Bruce Arena had a Bruce Arena press conference. Uh, we'll hit some uh, other quick hits around the league, including ranking the teams in Texas. And then, of course, your CCL preview NYCFC going to Seattle on Wednesday. Pumas and Cruz Azul doing their thing on Tuesday. And then we'll get into the mailbag. A ton of U.S. national team, Canadian national team, World Cup stuff in there, as well as Tom Bogert asking about uh, umbrellas and raincoats. So uh, if we have time, Tom, we will try to get to that. Uh, All right, best thing that you saw in uh, week five. Get us started. Drum roll. I'm going to go with uh, Kalen. Get us started. I'm going to go with uh, center back goals. Um, and there were some pretty good ones. Wow. You can't, uh, it would start out with, uh, he's out of character, man. This, I don't know. This doesn't feel right. Well, this is, <laughs> this is Kalen a... playing center back, uh, in, in his Chivas USA days that he's bringing to the energy. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to spread the love around. And you know, there was, I think there were a number of own goals this weekend as well. So I, I think, uh, you got to pass it the other direction. And it, look, it also, when you look at Tui Loma, it doesn't look like a center back goal, right? We've seen him do this a couple of times now. So, uh, and then the other one that stood out to me, uh, Abubakar had a good one, uh, I think, to tie the game up, where he's kind of like gotten behind almost on that early ball that came across. Um, and then Mario, it was kind of a crazy one in the sense. First of all, he took his first one very well, um, showing some lateral movement, be able to get his composure to score that one, and then. Um, he almost scores the last one. He it literally was a Diego Chara esque like ninety yard sprint, high knees <laughs> all the way down the pitch, uh, and they were only up one goal at the time, which <laughs> made me on the road, which made me question, where is that center back going? But he ends up, uh, you know, sliding in and almost getting on the end of it, and then it ends up sealing the game with the four two win. So um, I love that one from Mario. That one stood out to me. But uh, Tui Loma is going to. What do you think show. of his celebration? The Mario celebration, where he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like acting like it was, should have been a header. He's head banging, and Mom- Mamadou falls next to him. I mean, those guys, nobody enjoyed a goal more this weekend that they didn't score than Mamadou Falls. <laughs> I think Jesus Mario's goal. I think he Mamadou Falls. You gotta look out for your center back partner, right? You want him. Yeah. Somebody gets a goal, you go, you do this together. Like this is your chance. I think just the key to Mamadou Fall is you do everything at 120. If the scale is one to ten, he's on a 120 at all times. His energy, I thought he scored the first half of watching that celebration because he was all the way there, and I love that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Speaking of being all the way there, the best thing I saw in week five is definitely some vintage Maxi Ruti. I feel Mm. like I've seen this goal. I I definitely feel like I've seen this exact goal live. Dave, you remember we were at – the uh, at El Capitan, the Texas Derby in in, oh, in yeah. Frisco. Yeah, remember? And like we did the pre-show, and we didn't have anything post-game, so we got to sit around and drink yeah. and watch the game and go around the stadium. And we're we, sitting there. We were doing the crawl at which, Albert Elise pre-game. Wait, I was yeah. gonna say which team yeah. was he on? Because he's played for all yeah. the Texas Dallas. Teams. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No, he was on Dallas. He was on Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Dallas yeah. at the time, and it was the same thing. Like I think Tesho hit a banger too that game. Yeah. Ball bounces and Maxie's like, what do I do here? Like the only thing I was ever programmed to do, which is just <laughs> just shoot, just smash my foot into it. Beautiful goal there. Then wanted to shout out uh, Tifo Sweat in Columbus for the Pipa Iguain Tifo. I, I thought that was a, a good moment this weekend to honor a legend in our league. Doyle, I think you're going to stick with our Columbus theme yeah. here on the best thing you saw. Yeah, it was, it was Caleb Porter's halftime interview. He He's really good at these. He's one of the coaches who kind of takes seriously the, the chance to, to – 
sort of elucidate his, his tactical ideas and his view of the game. So, uh, like, and I really appreciate when coaches do that. He's one of the best in the league, along with Jim Curtin and, and Brian Schmetzer. Like, they always have time to talk about this stuff. And Caleb's very good at going into detail. But also, uh, his tone when talking about Nashville's approach <laughs> to the game <laughs> was incredibly expressive, and, and Anders got the clip for us. Go ahead, bud. Yeah, they were playing the same system and plan we thought they would, obviously dropping into basically a 5-4-1, looking to hit us in transitions. Thought we were very unlucky on the goal. Pedro slips. So now it becomes a little bit harder. They could be even more deep, and it's tough to break down. Oh, uh, look at these guys. Look, at, I'm surprised they didn't have, like, somebody in the background doing, like, the bus backing up noise while he did that. A beep, beep, beep. Yeah, he was uh, he was telling you what he was seeing out there, huh? Yeah, Nashville um, Nashville knows how to park a bus. Uh. He knows how to, they know how to park a bus. And, and, uh, and it, it, you know... I kind of, I kind of had sympathy for for Caleb right there because it wasn't the prettiest soccer game to watch, and it, uh, you know, it's a shame for the crew they couldn't figure out how to get three points on on the day that they honored Pipa. So. Uh, a lot of not this again vibes from Caleb Porter. Yeah, he looks like he's uh, stuck in a time lapse. Yeah, <laughs> God, you gotta be kidding me, Gary. Uh, all right, Dave, finish this off, and we'll dig in deeper to some of these games. Uh what else? I'm going to go young player. I'm going to go Canadian team as well. Georgie Mihailovic burying Nick Hagland in front of a yeah. live crowd. And then the <laughs> second goal as well to finish it off uh, for the assist for Kai. They get the 4-3 win. Um, I, I've been saying it all year. I think he's gotten better. I think he's more goal dangerous. I think you just see a guy who understands his level is here and that he can do whatever he wants. And you saw it again in this game. And I also go back to... I think the cultures that you're having be built at some of these clubs, I think giving the keys to Georgie last year and some of the other young players creates a culture where Ismael Kone can step in and sort of be the guy. And you can make mistakes, but like there's proof that the coaching staff will believe in you and it's paying off for Montreal right now in the league. I think it will continue. I think CCL was a large part of the start. And uh, I hope that they got ESPN Plus in uh, Qatar because I hope Greg Berhalter watched this game. We will talk more about Georgie in a bit because, uh, yeah, I don't know if he buried Hagland. Like, Hagland got run into his own grave, so to speak, <laughs> on that one. Could not keep up with Georgie. All right, let's dig in. Uh, the game on Sunday, lone game. This is the big one. One, uh, Javier Hernandez, Chicharito. Guy's decent. Galaxy go to Portland, win 3-1 on two Chicharito goals. There were some <clears throat> controversial decisions refereeing-wise in this one. Instant replay is your show for that one. We are uh, presented by Cheez-It. Just get the plug in, of course. Full shows on YouTube. We have a truncated show we put on MLSsoccer.com. I'm sure we'll still talk about these because Kalen was all up in the text messages being like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's happening here <laughs> last night? But let's start with Chicharito and the result for the Galaxy. Kalen, I'll, I'll let you start here too because you know more about attacking movement than any of us. What he did on that first goal, he just ran uh, – speaking of running Zuparic into the, his own grave, like he absolutely had him on the string. I, I was thinking of like a lantern fish last night. This is a vintage idiotic weeby uh, imagery here. <laughs> you know, and they have like little dangling thing in the deep sea and they get other fish to be like, that's where they're – I need that. That's where he's going. I got to follow that. And then they come around and just, you know, eat you. Felt like he did that to Dario. He was like, go this way. This is the way you want to go. And he knew the whole time he was going to hit the brakes, go back post. And what's he do? He pokes it in. Well, the funny thing is you'd, you'd say, well, you got to know he's going to do that, right? But if you don't respect the near post run, you're finished too. So <laughs> you saw... That's the third goal. Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. He kind of just... It, he sort of just... And that one, he kind of just stops. And I think on the broadcast, they say he, he didn't know where the goal was. He didn't look. He takes a quick little glance actually over his shoulder and sees that exactly where the goal is, the positioning of the goalkeeper, and gets his feet set. Um, so he, he kind of like masters in both ways... The idea of using motion to create space and then also just stopping sometimes uh, for a striker is just when when the entire back line is moving backwards, just stop and see you find that little pocket of space. And uh, he did that in the third one as well. So uh, but even outside of that, I mean, he was active. He was lively. Um, he was he looked sharp even in possession or times where he kind of checks the ball, holds it, plays it off, then is available again. 
Um, so he just really looked up for it. And, you know, there's going to be conversation around the uh, national team and the Mexican national team, and, and there should be. Uh, when you look at the way Mexico's national team um, has struggled to find goals and struggled to find finishers, really. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, same around the U.S., but w w that's kind of been the call for Josie Altador at times where it's like if he could get on a run like this, could he maybe come back in? Um, but Chicharito's form right now I think indicates that he um, – should be in that picture and should be in that mixture. I, I don't know what happened like from a more political, personal perspective. And I think that's probably a, a deeper story that uh, maybe someone like her can uh, figure out and tell us more about. But from just the performance side of things, you have to say the way this guy's playing, it's, it's like lights out. He looks fitter than he has in years past. Um, it's kind of, you know, he's had that injury bug in the past, but um he really sets the tone for this team. They play so well, but um, and he's built a really nice little relationship with Raheem Edwards, who was great again in this one. Simu Grinsar was great, and then mm -hmm. he was not as great on the back end of that. Like As I said last <laughs> night on MLS After Dark, again, MLS Today is the podcast channel. All the other stuff goes there. So if you're looking for something outside of ETR, that's a good place to start. Uh, Grinsar giveth and he taketh away. Uh, they're just they're, the, the crazy miss, some of the like inconsistencies around the 18, but no Douglas Costa in this one, and the Galaxy are able to go and get a pretty comfortable 3-1 Doyle. I mean, I, I, think, I think you can describe this as pretty comfortable. That's a good result for Greg Vanny, no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I don't know if I 100% agree it was comfortable. Like it, Portland, they, they still have, even though they're not playing well, they still have so many weapons that it always feels like they can push and cause you pain. And, like, they almost did down the stretch there, a couple of uh, penalty shouts and uh, Jonathan Bond having to, to make um, a, a couple of nice saves. But it, in general, I agree, right? Like, Galaxy were the better team. And the Galaxy, um, I think they have better ideas going forward now than they have in a long, long time. Like, it looks like Greg Vanny soccer. That first goal, as Kalen was talking about, it's Chicharito's movement, but it's also the movement out of midfield from Ravellison and then ground seer getting, you know, isolated on a not very good defensive fullback. Um, so it, it's... It, it, they, they look the part more than they have... Um, for years and years, right? They're not out there just snatching victories because they have Zlatan or, or relying on complete breakdowns. Not that there were, I mean, there were some complete freaking breakdowns from, from Portland and the Galaxy did a good job of, of punishing that, but it was also like the Galaxy just being good at imposing their idea of how they want the game played on the team that they're coming up against and then having the pieces to turn that into chances. The issue for the Galaxy... and We've been saying it for a year and a half now. Is there's only one guy who turns those into goals? Chicharito's great, um, but Grantier or Cabral or Efra or Douglas Costa, when he gets back, one of those guys is going to have to be like a 10, 11 goal scorer, um, or or the ceiling gets much lower. Mark Delgado, two yellow cards, a red card in this one. He won't be available for El Trafico again Saturday, seven thirty p.m. Huge. Eastern. Fox, Fox Deportes, the understanding between him and Ravellison about when to stay, when to go, what spaces to occupy, who to get the ball. Uh, just so clean and, and efficient possession right now for those guys. Let's talk about the, the right side of the Portland uh, defense. Pablo Bonilla had a tough first half, man. He had uh, all in all, like a couple got roasted on a couple goals and then got a red card. And I was thinking about that red card. And we did instant replay, Dave. And I thought to myself, I've seen David Goss do that on a soccer field a number of times and never see red. Uh, feels like, that feels like a little bit, that was a little bit like a men's league moment, I thought. Wow. Like the little, you know, like the fake, you know, the fake, the fake massage from Ravellison. He's like, yeah, calm down. But he's really winding him up. You know how all this works. He's been in, in Ravellison's head, the, or excuse me, in Bonilla's head. And then you get the push. That looks like a little too much, but it's probably not neck or face, probably not closed fist, but then it's a violent conduct, maybe for the excessive force. I will say this. You have to give credit to Ravelson for not, like, making a show out of it. He yeah, doesn't he didn't react. fall down. He didn't know. He yeah, didn't. which everywhere else you would. I completely disagree with that uh, <laughs> reality or what you think the reality of my game is, although I will say I feel vindicated by Kalen Carr saying a legitimate move for a striker is to stop moving because that's what I always do when people ask yeah. me to well, play you, center you forward. You have to have the threat of moving, though. You have 
Oh man, it's, it's I don't stopping. have much of the foil. <laughs> it's not you've never started. You got to be moving to stop. <laughs> Listen, next time I'm on the field and I do it, I'm gonna say Kalen Carr told me this is how great strikers <laughs> play, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> Weeby, I guess I, I will agree with you, and I will say for Ravelson, it's just good. And Doyle sort of talked about Marky Delgado's impact on him that he's gotten comfortable because he was he was a huge addition for them last year, but at a position. Scored goals, which he shouldn't really need to do in the way he did. Played center back, all of those things. And I think for Greg's system to work, he needs he needs guys who can cover a ton of ground, especially with the 10 options they have and the way those players play. And so I, I think you saw in this moment a guy who feels comfortable in his surroundings to sort of start to troll the opponent and, and know like where he's at and where he sits in his team. Uh, and... I, I love anyone who's uh, good at that stuff. There's a well, line. You don't cross that line, but if you're right on that line, you get a, a hat tip from I, me. I've heard tell of some David Gus yeah. uh, red cards and co-eds and, and men. I'm yeah. just saying. I got two red cards in a high school soccer game, and that's not even possible. No. That, uh, Sebastian Blanco, <laughs> by the way, first start of the season for the Timbers, 72 minutes. That's his first start since MLS Cup against NYCFC last year. Eric Williamson made his second appearance uh, after coming back from injury, another sub appearance. He had four minutes against Orlando. He got 17 or so, I think, on this side. What is there to take for the Timbers? Do they're gonna be frustrated by some of the calls. I mean, you mentioned the PKs. I thought the the Pew one. I thought that was a PK. I don't know how that's not a handball, uh, based on on the laws. Um, but I'm also not a professional referee. I'm just a guy who talks about it on on YouTube. So you know, take it all with a grain of salt here. Uh, if you are if you're Geo, what are you thinking right now? Uh, maybe that they're in a little bit of trouble defensively they're they're all over the place they um their shape pushing up uh because it it seems like they're taking like more risks and not just necessarily with the fullbacks which was their thing for the first two-thirds of last year but um really with the center backs stepping up um so it, it's all kind of a mess but last year you could rely on blanco being um good enough to to cover up some of that um it, like you knew he he would show up and be the best player on the field for for good chunks of games but he he has not looked like that um basically at all yet and now maybe that changes right because he is working back from a significant injury and he did just get 70 minutes and um he wasn't sharp but he 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 looked pretty fit uh but it's it's hard to imagine him putting in 2000 minutes at the level he was at, um, you know, in late summer of la or early autumn of last year, uh, during MLS's back in, in 2020, like he, he, it's tough to ask that of a guy who's three four years old coming off of a major injury, um, and the rest of this team, with exceptions of you know occasional glimpses from Santi Moreno and um, you know Diego Chara still being Diego Chara. They, Jimmy Chara has been. I thought. I think Jimmy Chara has been been pretty decent as well he's been decent but he, he doesn't like we, we've gotten enough now to say like he, he's he's been better than decent he's not a focal point in the way that Sebastian Blanco can be a focal point point. and then the other thing is that Nizgoda's ghost. I was just gonna say he's a, a you know like Bunk. he he has not like it, compare him to Chicharito, yes, and I know that's like kind of unfair because Chicharito is one of a kind, but like still, your movement has to cause some sort of danger, some sort of havoc in the opposing back line, and they're getting none of that. So that forces the midfield to be even more aggressive, and that maybe kind of explains the the guys on the back line stepping up and, and getting a little disjointed. So it's not like even though Portland is no Felipe that Mora, talent, right, Dave? <laughs> right, he's no he's no Felipe Mora. So even though Portland has that talent, and like I said, it, it's, it never feels comfortable against them, it's so disorganized that it feels like anybody they're playing is going to find you know, plenty of chances, and then they don't have Steve Clark. I mean, Steve Clark has been so underrated for the past five or six years, and um, Ivasic has not been able to replace that. Is your cat eating the yeah. plant? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure he's... That's our guy, like Taquito. Looks like a, the texture on that looks pretty tough. Not gonna he, lie, he's that's, not. He's not. That's the a smart de one. that's a desert plant. That's not a like a you know a lot of moisture that. in those leaves. Can I throw out the number of the week here uh, in Major League Soccer? <laughs> that number is seven hundred and fifty-six. That is the record for regular season fouls committed 
which now belongs jointly, which I think is the proper way to, uh, for, for temporarily joint, uh, to Kyle Beckerman as well as Diego Chara. So Diego Chara, uh, he's, a, he's a record setter. He is going to hold this record. I don't know that it'll ever be broken after he takes it on his own. I just want to throw out some numbers here. Cause like, yeah, Kyle Beckerman, he, he fouled a lot of guys. He played a lot of years in this league, and he did. He played many more years and many more games than Diego Chara. So 756 fouls for Kyle Beckerman and 498 games played. 461 of those are starts. So if you're like, okay, well, early days, he didn't really start much. A lot of bench appearances skewed. Well, it's still 461 games started. It's 41,164 minutes for 756 fouls. That means he made a foul or committed a foul every 54.4 minutes. Diego Chara matched this record in 27,743 minutes. Literal, like, literal, se- multiple seasons full of time. I think, honestly, what, a full season is a little more than 3,000 minutes? So if we're talking full seasons, that's like, that's like four and a half seasons of time. <laughs> That he matched this record. Every 36 minutes, Diego Chara is getting a foul. Now, that's like three fouls a game. You'd think maybe more yellow cards. As you know, I think that's the point you made, Dave, in our pre-show meeting of like, man, like, <laughs> these are racking up here. Like, where, who's handing out the I, accumulation yellows? Like, Diego, <laughs> I know you're listening. I never said anything. It was him. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Not a word. came out of my Not mouth. Not a word. This is an incredible record. Congratulations to Diego Chara and uh, a party for him when he breaks it inevitably in the next match. <laughs> uh, what a legend. Any thoughts on that before we keep it moving? Yeah, if you're a Vancouver player, you got to just hang around Chara first 15 minutes of the game, leave a little leg out, be like, oh, do you want to foul me? Because you want to be a part of history, right? Exactly. Get the jersey afterwards. Yeah. Like He fouled me to, to set the record. Yeah, I would love to uh, know who he's fouled the most in his career. And same, I would also... same for Beckerman. I would love... <laughs> just in general like if you, you clearly love this but like who do you love kicking the most can i give you the top 10 and i might even take it to the top 15 all time fouls in history because it's just like a, oh no bleep dima kovalenka uh let's I, see I dima's saw... not in, no not enough games i saw the lorenowitz is three okay yeah he's third beckerman shara lorenowitz ozzy's got to be up there Five five hundred. Are there any center backs committed. on there? Uh, I do not see. Oh wow! Uh, well, well, uh, uh, you would probably never get a... this one. Carrie Talley would tie for for fifteen. Oh, wow. no, so that's a that. throwback for you. Okay. And Tyron uh, Marshall is just outside. Is Kai in the top fifteen? Kai is. He's wow. number eight. Four hundred eighty-three. Wow. That was a, that was a difficult one that I didn't know if anybody would be able to get. Yeah. Uh, who else is on this list? We've got a we've got an Austin FC assistant coach on this list at number seven. Davy Arno. Davy Arno, four hundred and eighty nine. Nobody will be surprised. Nice. Davy Arno was, the, was the master of the tactical foul. <laughs> yes. Just wiping out a guy mid transition. It's like mm, no, this is not this is not a four on three. <laughs> well, ben Olsen esque. What, what about my guy Logan Paws? No, Logan no, no, Paz no. is too not clean. too smart. Too Didn't clean. actually commit. He, you know, yeah. more known for not. Kalen's so about, upset that I said that. We got a number <laughs> four do from eight that you know, played in H Town. Also an assistant Ricardo coach in Clark. this league. Ricardo Clark. Yes, oh, five hundred and eight. I like that. Uh, here's one. We got an EPL head coach in the top ten. Nice, Jesse. Jesse's right. Jesse yeah. number nine with four hundred seventy-seven. Although it could have been Chris Frank Armas Lampard. In there? Uh, <laughs> no, Chris Armas is not in here. Huh. Pretty incredibly, yeah. honestly. Uh, yeah. We have a Caribbean legend who we often talk about on Shall- the show. Shall we? Shall we? No. No. Oh. oh, actually, he's 14. Sorry, he's 14. <laughs> so he's he's barely in the top top 15. And we already Atiba said. Atiba Harris. Oh, oh nice. Atiba. Atiba. Yeah, Atiba racked up 497 over the course of his career. Which, Chris Henderson. impressive because a number of positions. Full back, midfield, wing. He was all, all over, over the, the place. place. Yeah. Doesn't matter where he plays. He fouls. He's a very yeah. versatile uh, fouler. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Chris Henderson's here, 10. He and Pablo oh. Mastroeni sharing that, both of oh. them with some, some fusion roots back in the day, I believe. Uh, and then Brian Mullen and Roger Espinoza uh, round out our top 15 here. Mm. So those are the most prolific so foulers. No cent- so so the center backs. History. Who was the center back on the list? Well, Kerry Talley was at 15. That's it. Yeah, she was more of right ah. Well, sorry. Yeah. So... <laughs> So Roger can still get up, though, right? Yeah, Roger can climb this list. He's, yeah. you know, Gims- Kai can climb this list. That's what Kai's Ozzie doing. could definitely climb this list. We just got to see how long Ozzy can uh, can keep it rolling. Uh, all right, let's talk. Uh, let's talk LAFC in Orlando. Uh, maybe the I don't know second or 
most entertaining game of the weekend. Six goals in this one. Carlos Vela is looking dangerous. He will be available again, knock on wood, for El Trafico next Saturday. LAFC are on fire to start the season. Four wins, one draw, one of only three unbeaten teams in the entire league. Even Brian Rodriguez is scoring for them. <laughs> this is this is ideal start for Steve Chirundolo. This is uh, this is how he would draw it up going into this first El Trafico. What have we seen from LAFC so far? What did you see from them uh, in this game? And, and caveat here, Dave, what did you see in the first half of this game? Because you really <laughs> only watched first halves. Yeah. This I, week, so I, I would like to start us on the first half. Yeah. We could go from there. I will say across the league, some really great first halves were played. What happened Explain, after that please. is not uh, why, my why are we? Uh, yeah. yeah, all those games I downloaded died at halftime. So, uh, so that's all I'm aware of. And uh, I thought Orlando actually looked pretty good in possession, and were able to knock things around and create chances. Pato almost gets that first goal. Then he gets the second goal. I'm trying to figure out how to text on a plane to Weavey. Like 24 hours later, because I know uh, the criminal, excitement is palpable. Criminal, criminal that he got the first goal taken away. I mean, this man should – he comeback player of the year is already in the bag. But I will say this. Coming into this year, I think I sort of wondered, how does LAFC get better besides getting healthy? Um, because in my mind, Bob Bradley's the best American coach in the world right now, and the team was sort of built by him. And I, I'm not saying this in a way that I think Bob discounted this, but there are veterans in this team, and they haven't had that to lean on. And when you have injuries and Ryan Hollingshead steps in, and they've got Ilya Sanchez as a part of the starting lineup. Did I say it wrong, Weeby? No, you said it right. And Damn. by the way, his goal was Absurd. absolute yeah. filth. But, but those are players who, one, you can trust. Other players can rely on when you're like a Brian Rodriguez. You don't have to put everything on their shoulders. Uh, obviously, Maxime Crepeau in goal, I think, just makes life so much easier for those for that back line in terms of you know what's going on behind you. You don't have to be chasing at all times. The structure to that back line is probably the best we've seen since they won Supporter Shield. And so you add all that into getting a, uh, a healthy and motivated Carlos Vela sometimes, and, and that's what LAFC can be. Um, and that's what it looked like, and it was impressive to watch. They're super entertaining still when they're on, uh, and Mamadou Fall has up, has taken his game to the next level. I thought last year he filled in well, but it was a player who has a ton of potential showing that, but also showing holes in his game. And I think you're seeing a, a partner now to Jesus Maria of understanding when to step, when to drop. I like the ability for him to attack and, and sort of create turnovers and whatever when he needs to, because Maria has the understanding of when he's going to go, which is, I actually thought would be his role with Segura. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's what the first half looked like. Good good segue into our 2222 Player of the Weekend presented by Body Armor, and uh, that would be Mamadou Fall. And, Doyle, your early rankings here, you shared with us that, uh, that Mamadou, is, he's at the very top for you. That's he that's is. pretty incredible. Yeah, it's, it's like he, he wasn't the best this weekend, I don't think. Like he said, other games were uh, he was more eye-catching and uh, – you know, Orlando City gave LAFC a little bit of hell in this one. Uh, but what Mamadou Fall is doing as a 19-year-old center back in this league um, is unprecedented. And it's, it's not just the eye test, though. Like, if you know anything about soccer and you watch a game, um, he, he does jump off the screen at you and, like, you, you notice him. Uh, but, like, all the underlying numbers love him. And um, he, he is... Uh, I think wise, but beyond his years. In a, in addition to being just like an incredible athlete, he he like he plays the game um, w with a level of maturity that's it's rare. It's why you don't see many teenage center backs. Um, I like as great as, as Gaga Slonin has been uh, for the Fire. Is is you know high level is is we all think Jesus Ferreira is, and there's a half dozen other guys who could maybe make a, a run at the number one spot. Like I, if the voting was right now, I, I would, I would have Mamadou fall atop the 22 under 22 list. He, he's just superb. They've been good Pretty in the back. I would say the, the, I think they have the most goals in MLS, uh, LAFC, which when you look at, I think they're actually tied with Austin who have obviously <laughs> had an amazing start, but I'm not sure that's going to carry. Don't say it. Uh, don't say it. They don't like it when you say that. Oh, all right. <laughs> I, I played for Houston. I'm, leave me alone. <laughs> uh, uh, I, but I, I think, like, 
at times last year we saw it. It's felt like for a while that maybe LAFC was kind of like stuck in second gear, uh, um, and like this feels like to Doyle's point on the way the game was with Orlando. It was like Orlando could have scored more goals, LAFC could have scored more goals, <laughs> and when it comes into those types of situations. You know, they end up winning 4-2. I think last week they won 3-1. It's like they now have the ability more to kind of blow the doors off a game if they need to. And I'm not sure we had that in the past. Um, And this was also only the second match, I believe, that they had that front three of Rodriguez, Arango, Mm. and Vela from the start. So they still haven't really had a ton of time on the pitch together to kind of build that relationship. And then the last piece, I would say, is just like the depth um, just as you mentioned, Holling said, Ilya Acosta was on the bench. They brought in C. Fuentes. Tishari Shradi came in and made has been good. Got yep. the last goal. Yep. Uh, Tishari Shradi had a nice pass kind of late to help seal the, seal the win. Um, and then I think the bigger difference is like how many times in the past have you seen um, an LAFC goalkeeper kind of save them from a bad result? And there were just a couple saves where you felt like Cripo was going, he either got to it or there was the one where I guess uh, Moutinho should have finished it. Um, but even, like, he was kind of had the, at least the bounce covered, at least the direction of where it was going. So, uh, Cripo, I think, to be able to, in these tighter games that can be high scoring, um, to be able to come up with a save or two to kind of get them a result, that's something I can't say that they've had um, over the years to be able to uh, to kind of take it to the next level is that number nine position, which I think Arango is, and that goalkeeper position have been kind of the two places they've used almost as like flex uh, for LAFC where they do it like a cast of characters. And now they have two guys that I think they can like really lean on throughout that. I'd like to, Kalen mentioned the front three, the, the first time they've been together. The midfield three was obviously somewhat rotated. So I'd like to point out, since everyone likes to point out my mistakes, that all of you picked Kalen Acosta as a top number six in the league, and he's played zero minutes there so far this year. Please continue. Uh, we will continue. If you miss Doyle going to feed his cat, um, <laughs> that is another nice moment for those of you who like to watch on YouTube. Uh, so that was fun. <laughs> Let's talk Orlando City real quick and then look ahead to El Trafico before we keep it rolling. Uh, the year of Pato continues, obviously, but the bummer here is that Antonio Carlos left this match torn hamstring, and Orlando's saying that's a four- to six-month injury. That, I mean – I don't want to even speculate about what might have happened to that hamstring. It just that, That's a long, long time. Uh, DeGuru uh, hit us up here on Twitter. says, how much worse is this season going to be for Orlando City? Early season struggles. Now the one good defensive player out for the season. I don't know if it's the only one. Uh, he is, here. He he is by would, far the best. Would, yeah, so sure. No, I agree with that. You'd start with their attacking prowess and then move back. Yeah. And Jensen's been okay, but he... He's made better by Antonio Carlos. Well, look, when presence. two goalkeepers on the field now with Gaia True. and Schlegel. So there's a different, you know, there's something else coming here. It's there's a, good a wrinkle. Thing Schlegel's a goalkeeper because he's definitely not a defender. <laughs> oh, boy. So, okay. So, look, the question from Deguru is are we in trouble? Uh, yeah. Doyle, are they in trouble? A little bit, yeah. Um, I, I still think this will, they'll figure out how to be a playoff team. It's Oscar Pereja. He figures stuff out. He's a really good coach. Um, but it's taking longer to put the attack together than I think anybody had hoped for, uh, for one. And for two, because of that, they've had to sit deep, defend, and counter. And Prairie House teams have always done that. Even his greatest Dallas teams would go entire months where they basically were like, no, we're not going to have any possession. We're just going to absorb and we're going to hit on the break. And they were good at it, and they eventually figured it out. But here's the thing. Um, If your center backs aren't great, it's really (laughs) tough to do that. And, um, you know, I, I like Robin Johnson uh, a lot, um, but he's not an elite defensive center back in this league. Antonio Carlos is, and the drop-off from him to Schlegel or maybe 17-year-old Tommy Williams gets on the field. He's a, you know, a homegrown kid with a huge upside, a really big prospect. 17's really young to, to be a center back in a professional league. Um that drop off is going to be substantial and it's going to make it harder for them to defend and counter, which puts more onus on them to figure out the midfield shape and the ability to defend by possessing the ball um, more quickly than they have so far. So it, it's, it's become urgent with, with this injury. 
probably thinking summertime or maybe before because I think the window's still open. You got to get some more depth on the center back side probably if you're Orlando City. All right, other big matches. Cincinnati 3, Montreal 4. Doyle's tweeting in the first half that Montreal got to go back to the drawing board. Montreal win the game. That's a Cincinnati match at home. That's the way it goes. Bow down to your new golden boot leader, Brandon Vasquez. Everyone, uh, yeah, five goals so far. Had a nice little little goal in this one. Stayed calm in front of net, found his space, slotted at home. Uh, people, Doyle, you, uh, we have a note in here. Are you serious about USMNT? Did I miss something yes. in the column? The 7,000 words I have not read yet? I mean, uh, I'm serious. Give me the... about, I'm serious about U.S. call-ups for, for both Brandon Vasquez and Georgie Mihailovic. What Mihailovic has done uh, for the past 18 months since moving to Montreal sort of speaks for itself. Um, and he, this game was a master class from him. Now it's tough because I, I really think he's more of a half space guy or like an attacking winger in Berhalter's formation than he is like a pure central midfield free eight pass before the pass guy. Um, So instead of competing for that fourth spot on the depth chart uh, with like Busio or, uh, you know, Sebastian Legette, he's more, I think competing in in that Pulisic Reina way uh brennan aronson paul Ar- like there's a lot less room jordan morris jordan morris um so there's a lot there's a lot less room there but he like he, we have to see him with in the nation wait league, why is he not is competing against June. the midfield guys he doesn't win the ball he, he's not a, like the the free eights in in burr system you have to be able to win the ball and you have to be ball secure and like he's he's gotten much better with his ball security, but he's still not much of a defensive presence. Um, certainly, I mean, think about like Eunice Musa and, and Weston McKenney. Even Luca Delatore has been really good defensively when he's played. It's just a different skill set. So not to say he can't do it, but like he's not really asked to do that for Montreal. I would like to see him there, um, but you know, time is short. Uh, and as for Brandon Vasquez, uh, we're getting like. Obviously, he's out there scoring goals. He's leading the goal boot race. He's got five goals in six games. He closed last year with, I think, four goals and two assists in his final six games or so, something like that. Um, We're getting past the point where it's just small sample size. He's on a heater. Um, And we've seen guys like that before. Mason Toy, a couple years ago, remember for Minnesota, where he was scoring two bangers a week? Um, it, he's Mason Toy's incredible, gifted, you know, talent, but like that type of a goal scoring is not sustainable, and that was showing up in the underlying numbers. And of course, Mason Toy then dropped off. What the good thing, you know, this is not to bash on Mason Toy, who I love. Last year, Mason Toy figured out a lot of the, the like how to get into good spots, how to how to you know, take the types of shots that lead to repeatable, the Chicharito stuff, man. Like, like how to do that stuff so that you're getting one touch finishes. Mason Toy showed a lot of that last year. Brendan Vasquez, that's what his goals are. He, he It's one touch finishes in the box. Uh, it was the same last year as, as it is this year. And the underlying numbers have actually been screaming this for like two or three years. And Tyrone Marshall finally got him on the field last year down the stretch after Yap Stam was thankfully let go and Pat Noonan came in this year and said I'm not going to fix what's clearly not broken and it like it's showing up in the numbers in, in expected goals Chicharito is number one in the league Brandon Vasquez is number two Brandon Vasquez like he's ahead of center forwards in the league who take penalties Brandon Vasquez doesn't take penalties if he did he'd be on seven goals you know like, like so it's it's all it's all showing up Right, the box score, the eye test, and the underlying numbers are all aligned. And there are two points here. One is that Brandon Vasquez was always supposed to be this type of forward. Remember, he was the center forward for the U.S. Youth National Team with, with that. The it was the Pulisic McKenney Adams team. Like Brandon Vasquez was a center forward on that guy. He just got lost in the shuffle at Cholos and then at Atlanta, two teams that do not do any sort of player development. So that's one. He, he was supposed to be this guy. Um, and for number two, it's just the need is there. It, it reminds me of 2010 where nobody had Edson Buttle or Herc Gomez in the U.S. player pool um, eight months before the World Cup. Both of them started scoring goals. Um, both of them made it to the World Cup. The door's open for anybody 
anybody in this number nine pool to to come in and win a job. And right now, it feels like that's what Brandon Vasquez is doing. Um, and when you have the eye test and the pedigree and the underlying numbers and the box score numbers all aligning, why would we not? see him in a U.S. national team camp. Yeah, I think Doyle's right now. Doyle's not saying put him in the World Cup roster now. It's giving him an opportunity. I think the one thing that jumps out to me, especially the last two weeks watching him, is the quality of soccer player that he is outside of just the finishing. And now you're talking about a guy that interests Greg Berhalter. And it's not just, yeah, it's not what you want, but give him a shot. This is the player he wants. He's happy to drop deep. He picks up the ball. He's two-footed. Right now, his passing is clean and crisp. He gets out of really tight spaces. That was one of the things that jumped out to me in this Montreal game. He picks up the ball. He's double teamed on the sideline. He gets out of it. He gets stuck in a corner. He wins a corner kick. He is a guy who, right now, every action has a purpose. He's playing with confidence, and therefore it's crisp. And he's about to show you, over the course of the first two months of the season, that he can play in different systems with different players. So it's not just this one thing works. And he can play that role, but can he bring it to the U.S.? He's going to play with by himself, with Dominic Baji, now with Brenner, whether it's a diamond, whether it's not. He's going to show you different things. And I think that, to me, is what jumps out of saying, one, he's 23. This isn't, oh, did a guy randomly find form or a hot streak? This is him developing as a player. He is at this stage now. And two, he is a high-level soccer player. So even if he's not the pure finisher at the national team, or if he doesn't score every game, he can still help the team in ways that Greg Berhalter wants at the center forward position. I'm a little bit more skeptical, I think, from my perspective. Yes, I think this number nine position is still an open for a player like Vasquez to come in. Um, and I th agree with all the things you guys are saying. I, I just think the sample size is still a little small. They've only played... Even when you look at the, some of the teams they played, I think he had two against Orlando, two against Cincinnati. No, it was two against <laughs> he plays uh, for sorry, Cincinnati. Miami. <laughs> I know, two against Miami. <laughs> He's always getting easy goals. <laughs> who's, the, who's the goal? Who's the golden boot leader? How many do they have against Cincinnati, though? Huh? How many do they have against That's Cincinnati? That's actually a demerit him, for him that he doesn't get to play against Cincinnati ever. Yeah, I mean, Miami was one of those. You're right. I, you're looking at the, the results. They, I mean, just they're, the teams that they've played so Austin. far this year, they, they haven't even gone against – um, some of the better competition yet. So I, I'd like to see him carry it forward, um, but absolutely open to that idea. That's, that's actually the argument for Georgia, I think, on the other side, is the fact that this hasn't just been you know, a good start to the season, um, but it's been prolonged over time. And to Doyle's point on the number eight situation, uh, I think it's going to be tough for him to break into that first area with those those names that you mentioned the one thing that i like is maybe not from the start so much because of that sort of uh, ball recovery thing but if you're in a position where you need somebody to come into a game um, i haven't seen a lot of our eights really be as goal dangerous as he has uh, weston's probably the only guy that i know that is like able to kind of make those penetrating runs and get around um, into the box and create opportunities for himself and for others and i just think that like level of creation um, coming from the midfield position and being able to get um, into the box himself and score goals is something that the national team still needs. Um, maybe I think I, I hear what you're saying as far as him being asked to do a lot of different things, but De La Torre, I don't see him being so super goal dangerous. Uh, I don't see uh, Leggett in that same position, although he, he can make those late arriving runs, but hasn't been able to do them, I don't think, to the consistency that uh, Georgie has. So I just think somebody that you think could maybe turn a game if you need it. Um, and just, so I, I don't know if he would need to compete as a st starter necessarily. Um, Cause I don't think he, that spot is even really open and we kind of have that settled. Whereas you start to look at guys maybe from different sort of game models or game, what it would get game states where you would come into a match. Um, he might be somebody that I'd like to take a look at from that perspective. I think over the time that he's done it um, deserves a shot to, to be. And also, position. Well, I was going to say, also, I was down oh, in there. Costa Rica watching the draw, and if Wales makes it in Spanish, you spell it G-A-L-S, and he can do it against Gales, so I believe in him. 
I just thought that was fun the whole time. I don't. I, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think I got that one. <laughs> that, that one was. So I was like, I was waiting to see if anybody else <laughs> yeah. got it, and I was like, oh crap! Like, where am I on this? <laughs> Do we want to go back through it, or we just keep it going? No, no. I think we just. Uh, I think we keep that. Keep it rolling here. Uh, appreciate the effort on the Philadelphia Union, Charlotte FC. Uh, two to nothing win for Philly, but I just want to throw it in here for. They're top of the East, uh, 13 points, tied with LAFC for Supporter Shield right now. But Julian Carranza got his first goal big for the fight and Doyles uh, in the Golden Boot race. But also, did I read correctly that Jim Curtin came out afterwards and made a Tati comparison with Julian Carranza after his first goal for the Union? I I think Doyle's muted. I didn't hear that. <laughs> Doyle's definitely yeah. muted. Yeah. Actually, Doyle's Julian Carranza yeah, energy yeah. just flipped all the power off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shut down I mean, the grid. I, 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 if he, I, I missed that. I didn't actually see that comparison. You, can, I could see it defensively. Like Carranza's a monster d- defensive center forward, and uh, obviously that's how Tati got himself on the field first and foremost. And he, he's a really good setup man. Um, he's got two assists already this year, two game-winning assists, and um, like Tati, he has to prove he could put the ball in the net. And Tati eventually did. Fighting Doyles can use a good 15 goal season for Julian Carranza. <laughs> Come on, Drew. keep Ura on the bench. You know what, Ura? We got the next Tati on this team. All right, you the loan. You already agreed the fee. Like build him up to as much as you can. That's uh, that's good business from the union. Uh, Revs losers at home to the Red Bulls. This was from Sunday night in the MLS After Dark segment that we did. Um, Charlie's that's whack was the performance from the Revs. Here's an amazing Bruce uh, quote after this one, which was a loss on a just an incredible own goal that uh, Andrew Farrell just pinged straight off of Matt Polster, basically as the game was was ending. So here's Bruce uh, quote: "Well, I don't think we should have lost that game, but I'm not sure we deserved to win. But we certainly didn't deserve to lose the game. You know what? Can you say that's the sport of soccer? If you haven't seen any of these games before, and uh, on whether or not they're going to get another Carlos Heel in the midfield, quote: We're not getting another Carlos Heel in the middle." He uh, was in prime form. We have another quote down the line about CCL that we'll get to. Basically, Bruce saying uh, MLS teams are not equipped to do this. At least the Revs haven't been. But Hop Skip hit us up. Hop Skip uh, on Twitter. International rap sensation and scourge of uh, New England Revs Twitter, which just an absolutely great combination there. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's going on in New England. Has Bruce lost his touch? Is he relying on older broken versions of his players to succeed? Is there something that can be fixed mid-season? He didn't add this here, but what the hell happened to Matt Turner? Like, I don't, I still don't understand what happened <laughs> to Matt Turner and where he stands. Like, he had frostbite. Frostbite's he irrelevant. Frostbite. He had didn't frostbite. Me, no, I do not believe he had frostbite. The frostbite, frostbite is not the frostbite relevant frostbite to the injury. Conspiracy. The injury was caused in a friendly against LAFC. Now, the real investigation is who kicked Matt Turner. That's the real investigation that we need legs on. My guess is that this is a burner account for Stevie Nichols. Everyone knows one of the top rappers in England and a huge fan of the New England rappers. At at official hop skip. We see you, Stevie. We know. We know who you are. Uh, How about the Red Bulls? Ten points, second in the East, and uh, one of the best regular season records since week 24 of 2021. That's a Mark Fishkin poll. with Very convenient dates on that, Mark, to go back and cherry pick. (laughs) Uh, but there are also three wins, no losses, no draws on the road this season. Any big takeaways, any big learnings uh, from this game? Uh, the Red Bulls are, in a lot of ways, who we thought they were. Um, Carlos Coronel is an elite goalkeeper in this league. He had a spectacular late save. Oh, that I think save it, was unbelievable. On, it was on Legit, right? Bursting out yeah. of midfield. Un- yeah. yeah, the little header down. I don't know how he – I don't know how so he got it. Was so, it was so good. And, and like – he he keeps them in games when the defense is not clicking, but the defense is usually clicking. And it's especially so because Drew Yearwood and Frankie Amaya, who got a red card, so he wasn't perfect, but those two guys, they've just had an instant partnership this year, and it makes them so hard to break down. The other thing they do is whoever they're playing, they make them play Red Bull soccer. Like, they, they do not let up. Um, other than maybe the final 20 minutes against Columbus two weeks ago, like every every team that plays Red Bulls plays on Red Bulls terms. And, and when you have that kind of control of the game, you're giving yourself a, a good chance to to get a lot of wins. The question is, is can any of the attackers be good enough? The underlying numbers love Patrick Lamala. 
uh, but he he has not put the ball in the net. Uh, Ashley Fletcher has not really been an answer early. Hey, but he put that cross in. Remember That's that true. moment? That's true. Uh, that other moment where he like dilly dallied in the corner yeah, late in the he, game he and they lost on that. This yeah. time, this time he was like, "I'm putting this cross in." Yeah, and, and Luke, it worked Luke out. had a, a hand in the goal as well. I think he he forced the Revs to play back, or, or he, he created a turnover. Um, but like some like they, you you can't one nil yourself to the top of the standings. But I think you can um, get to the playoffs again that way. And if one of these guys starts putting the ball in the net pretty consistently, then this team, we're not talking about them just making the playoffs. We're talking about them having a home game and, and being like a dark horse nightmare of a matchup. More on the Revs and uh, Bruce down the line here. Some uh, other results here, qu- some quick hits. I say that for Anders' benefit because he just keeps saying that we're going too long, that we have a CCL preview and – you know, I don't want to have to ignore the man later in the show, but I will. I will. Chicago nil, FC Dallas nil. That's the Chicago fire away at this point. Uh, they're one of those three unbeaten teams. That's four shutouts now for Gaga Salinina. They got this one without uh, Rafa Shihus, which is pretty big for them. Uh, Shakiri off injured about 20 minutes in. Calf tightness, so that's an issue uh, right now. We'll see where that goes. They're not creating much. I think they need, and you wrote this, Doyle, and I agree, they just need – Shakiri to be more than sort of a control the game midfielder. They need to have some cutting edge moments, and they also probably need some more talent up top, which they're getting. Jairo Torres is coming here at some point. Uh, but one goal allowed in five games when this used to be like the Keystone Cops team that we always just laughed at because they shot themselves in the foot. That's good work from Ezra Hendrickson to start the year. Doyle, I know you don't want to have the coach of the year talk a this early, so we, so we won't five weeks in. Uh, how about Columbus Nashville? Yeah. Nashville got their goal. Alex Muil special. <laughs> wing back to they, wing back. They, you know, you, they explode. Yeah, yeah, attack. you heard from Caleb Porter. Uh, it you, it you is wild happened, that there are teams uh, in this, this league point. that have zero D mids, and Nashville has five of them that can win them games. <laughs> like, they're playing a Nungana and Davis, and they have Godoy. It's, uh, it's good work by them. Roster building. Just, just waiting for Dax to get back. What a win on the road field, a without Walker is impressive. Yeah. Or not oh, Walker yeah. starting. Uh, yeah. Walker came in. I. Yeah, as a sub. They have seven points through five games. I think Gary said before the – we're going first-name <laughs> basis for sure. Said uh, before this one that if they get more than eight, he will be uh, ecstatic or some other – Question. Uh, I don't know. Some other phrase. Is Gary Smith more hop, English. skip who fouled Matt Turner in that game? Now we uh, – now uh, it all starts to unravel. <laughs> oh, it's it's being tied together here. Uh, Atlanta in D.C., one nothing win. Uh, Marcelino Moreno laid on. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have much, many thoughts on that game. We'll just keep it rolling here. How about this one? San Jose 2, Austin 2. Drop points for Austin. I think they were up 2 nothing here. A Bobasi, PK, and then Keg Cal, uh, our young man Keg Cal, getting a goal as well. But we have MLS Outlaw asking, what's the updated MLS power rankings in Texas? Do you have any thoughts on this, Kalen? What's the current power rankings uh, among MLS teams in Texas? We have Dallas. Uh, with that nil-nil draw, Houston with a big 3-1 win against Inter-Miami, their first road win in 585 days. And then you have Austin. And if you look at just the standings right now, if you, you know if you want to break it down like that, it would go Austin, Dallas, Houston, but they're all on eight points. Hmm. No, so uh, oh yeah, where, where do we stand here? Where do we stand? Um, I would say Austin, to me, is the clear one. Um of the group. I just think they have had the more convincing performances and I think have showed a little more um, going forward than the other two. I I do like this Dallas team. Um, I would say probably Austin, Dallas, then Houston. Um, That'd probably be my ranking right now, but I think it, I think it can change, but I do think Austin for me has been the, uh, is the best of the three. Uh, should we talk about Inter Miami and Houston real quick? I'm not gonna. Yay, I'm, other Houston! Than saying Phil first Neville away win things, in like a year. Some things, Congrats. yes. Afterwards, that yeah. were uh, yeah, two hour two hour delay in here in uh, in Miami, but uh, yeah, Fafa with some goals. Houston with the result. Houston above the playoff line right now in seventh with Ache Ache coming fairly soon. Let's go. Hell yeah. Uh, Houston Arrow says, for once, give the Dynamo a shout. Finally got the away win monkey off our back. They look solid defensively, led by Teenage Hadibi. Uh, and all without Sebas really doing much. Once he gets going, they're going to be uh, uh, on fire. Could they maintain oh, I was going to say, if you want to hear more, 
MLS Today is going to do a dive on Houston Dynamo tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time on my Twitter handle or anywhere hey. you get your podcast. Yeah. Just search MLS Today. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Tell a friend. We don't, you know, your, your shout outs come in then. All right. Uh, Rail Salt Lake, Colorado, Rocky Mountain Cup action. 1 1 here. We talked about uh, the goal from Wallace Abubakar. We have not talked about Justin Miram's wily play in the box. Hands up if you think that was a dive. No, <laughs> no. Okay. Kaylin, Kaylin is stuck out. with his people. <laughs> it was, I'll, I'll say it's a strategic dive. All right. Like, he, there's contact, there's contact, I and then he, he realizes, and he lets yeah. the. I think he realizes that the ball is maybe going away from him or he's about to get defensive help, but there was contact. And so I don't, I don't think you have to – look, could he stay up and fight through it? Sure, but it, it, it does affect his move towards goal. And if he was going to be – it maybe puts him off a little bit so he's not going to be able to get on the end of it. In which case, yeah, what are you doing? Go down. So I'm, I'm saying it was totally fair. Good call, and uh, I'm sticking with it. He saw his opportunity. He went down. That is, uh, that's you know, that's just, that's just veteran winger play mm-hmm. from Justin Miram in a rivalry match. Got to make the referee make a decision. All right, CCL preview was, time. Wait, Tuesday. can I just Pumas ask? Sorry, Cruz-Azul. not to take us off. Uh, was this Pablo? Because of COVID, I don't know who played when and where. Is this Pablo's first game at Colorado as head coach of RSL, or did they have one last year? I believe okay. so. It felt natural for him, yeah. which is worrying to me. It feels like he could go wherever he wants. Um, but yeah, it was that that was fun to see. I think that was a fun little element to this one. Yeah, big RSL, X are they second, as, second in the West? Yeah. Now? Yes, they you are. You want to talk about points. your LA teams? No, RSL just jams themselves right in there. Eager to see it's, where you guys put them in the power rankings tomorrow. <laughs> wow, you guys, wow. You, you guys, have a, you have a power what rankings is this? Vote you have too. a vote, yeah. You, oh, really? <laughs> 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 that was you, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All There's nothing right. Kalen values more than that. the than the holy power yeah. ranking. Bro, I will not be getting wow. sucked into that one. Sorry. Jeez. But I'll hop on every once in a while. To the show. Hide up on the poll bureau. We're like, well, Kalen's not showed up to the meetings, but uh, <laughs> I guess still part of the still part of the ruling class here, Kalen. Uh, all right, CCL preview Tuesday. Pumas Cruz Azul, 10 p.m. Eastern. That one is at uh, Olympico Universitario in uh, Mexico City, and then Seattle, New York City. 10 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, Lumen Field, FS2 to the end. But, of course, you'll be watching wherever, and then you'll be listening to us watch the game with you if that was something that you wanted to experience. Probably a lot of yelling, complaining, deja vu. The nice thing is you can't lose the Liga MX in the semis this year. It's not possible. Uh, so let's start with uh, Doyle's biggest Week 5 takeaway, which naturally is about one of these teams, and that would be NYCFC. Doyle, they lost 2-1 in Toronto, had a uh, – It's not bad luck, but kind of bad luck. Professional referee organization came out after this match and said, look, we made a significant error in the first half, eighth minute. Tyus Magno goes down under pressure um, from, I think, Kosi Thompson uh, for for Toronto, who, interesting enough, afterwards the game said, hey, the environment here for young players is amazing. Bob is giving us a ton of leeway. Well, he got leeway on this one because there was Mm -hmm. contact on Magno, but uh, Drew Fisher called it live, and then they went to the monitor to review it and took it off. But the thing is, they didn't have the right angle. All the angles that the VR had, as well as the one that was shown to Drew Fisher, were not the correct angles that showed the contact. And so afterwards, Pro said, hey, we biffed that one. Uh, So now we have that covered. Doyle, uh, your takeaway on NYCFC so far this season. This is the second year in a row that they they had a a goal kind of incorrectly ruled off uh, against Toronto. Because last year it was Tati blocking Alex Bono's distribution, right? And that one deflected into the... Deflected in that, and that that goal should have stood. I was, I was loud and wrong about how like no, they called it right, but like that goal last year should have stood. Anyway, uh, and I see they 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 are not the dynamic attacking team that they were last year, and I think a lot of it comes down to um, the fullback play. You know, the, the the there's no replacing Anton Tinnerholm, and. They've tried with Tavon Gray, and he's good. He's a good defensive fullback, but he's not going to be Anton Thinnerholm. Well, Tavon Gray has missed most of the past month now, um, so they've had to go further down the list, and they don't. So they're not getting width from that right side in particular. Um, that's sort of changed how their their ringers have to play and the amount of ground that Maxi Morales has to cover in central midfield and then flaring out to the wings. and like So it, it, they're not the overwhelming force in attack. Then on top of that, because they're 
attacking structure is a little different. They don't immediately get into their press like they did the last couple of years. And like it went kind of underappreciated just how good a pressing team NYCFC were last year. They actually led the league in expected goals generated and actual goals generated off of high pressing situations. They're like mid table at best so far this year. Now, granted it's a small sample size, but like it's, it hasn't been good. I thought that what we were seeing the last like three games uh, before the international break was simple fatigue. I thought like it's just you know too many miles, too many trips, you know too many minutes, a few too many injuries. They were just holding on for dear life at the end there, and that after the international break they would come back and look like a, a completely revitalized team. I thought they were a little better in this game, but they certainly did not look completely revitalized and looked nothing like the team that was really overwhelming with the quality of the soccer they played through most of 2021. I was going to say, I agree with what Doyle said, and, and I think in watching this game, it was tough because on the one hand, you're like, Nicholas Acevedo is not a right back. And on the second, it's like he's fourth on the depth chart at this point. Like, you've got a CCL game. I don't know how much to take from it, but I will say, take away the penalty. They should have been up 1-2-0 or two zero early. TFC hung on in this game, and then they get the goal against the run of play, and that's where they start to settle and find themselves. But it did feel like in these first 20 minutes that it felt like NYCFC. That I thought it did feel slightly um, suffocating for Toronto. And Toronto was lucky to still be in this game. Jesus Jimenez looks like a good early season signing. Had a segment that we were going to do with uh, the best under the radar signings from the winter window. But oh God, we have no time for that in this show. Let's talk quickly about uh, the Sounders in Minnesota, then put it all together and preview Wait, this match. did you match. mean the Sounders or did you mean win Pep Guardiola's the... Barcelona? Because let me tell you something. If you only uh... saw the first half, <laughs> boy, you were impressed. <laughs> Schwing. Uh, Sounders 2, Minnesota United 1. <laughs> Joe Paulo. <laughs> 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 Wayne's World uh, reference in 2022. <laughs> doesn't it? Doesn't it come from why. Minnesota? Could, yeah, I couldn't. Help, I don't know. Couldn't help myself uh, on that one. Uh, Joe Paulo is an absolute menace, and that brings us to a new segment on Extra Time. Uh, of course, presented by AT and T 5G. It's our fast, reliable, secure defensive midfielder of the month, presented by AT and T. And for this month, it is none other than Joe Paulo wearing the blacked yeah. out cleats, banging in galazos from way back. Before we talk Joe Paulo, I just want to tell the people at home that we had two pitches for this particular segment. One, when you're thinking about fast, reliable, and secure, when you're thinking about defensive midfielders, maybe Diego Char rose to mind. The other one that I thought they might choose was we were going to make monthly predictions that were fast, reliable, and secure. Anders went to the meeting with AT&T. AT&T replied that they didn't think that that was a realistic <laughs> well, uh, strategic plan for us, that our predictions were neither fast, reliable, or secure, wow. and therefore that that they was a, well, at a least poor idea. Yeah, for the sure. Show. They okay. nailed that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, hold on. Well, you did two golden boot drafts, and who did you leave out on this one? Like Every year before the start of the year, you picked now, who to be Now that we're nine minutes into year, a weeby like, animal comparison, and our prediction has been a 14 minute yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. lantern fish have what to and, do with what and like, in the what end the i pick a golden boot guy who doesn't play a single minute so you're welcome <laughs> there you go uh so our fast reliable secure defensive midfielder of the month presented by at&t is joe paulo he has been the key to ccl he has been the key to their play in mls for more than a year now he is one of the best signings and, and defensive midfielders in league history, I think. And, and he will be a key and invariably against NYCFC in this semifinal two-legged series, even though Ladero is back now and looking pretty good, even though Rui Diaz is back on the field. And I think Schmetzer said the reins are off uh, for those guys. But uh, wax poetic for me, someone who feels passionate uh, about I Joe think Paul. I had him in my top five for early MLS MVP voting. So I could start out and say – yeah, cust customary yeah. position for Joe Paulo. He's yeah, he's that classic D mid MVP. But what puts him there is a few things. One, his flexibility. Right, he has played center mid with Obed Vargas, who is 16 years old in CCL. He has played in front of a back three, a back four. He has played alongside Roldan, Rusnak, all of these different types of players, and yet he's able to have a high level performance. And I would say I really saw it shine in the away game at Lyon of sort of carrying at times Vargas, 
to allow him to be successful in these games. He can cover ground out wide to go pick up the ball. Um, he's so clean once he's in possession, both to start the attack, but also then what you see in this Minnesota game with his goal to follow it up and be an attacking piece. And so if he has someone next to him who's sitting deeper, he can step forward and create chances. And he's not just a part of the buildup. I think he's elite in that part of the game. But if he has someone like Roldan who's pushing into the attack or Rusnak at times in this game, he can sit deeper, clean up in front of a back line that now is missing a defender of the year candidate in Yaimar over the last month. And there's been no drop in form. You've won at Minnesota. You've picked up a CCL result you needed at Leon without him because of Jao Paulo in front of him. So you're talking about a guy who's got a complete game. He can help other people sort of get comfortable, get on the field. And his flexibility has been such a huge part. Seattle, and it's hard to say it now, I think coming into last year, I thought they were going to take a step back. It felt like they had some steals in the transfer market with Svensson, with Kim ki with Leardam, all guys who were high to great starters for them that were all leaving. And it didn't feel like the roster was going to be there. And Nico Ladero missed all of last year. Rui Diaz has been hurt. And Jao Paulo, his uh, performance and the level he's played at for them in consistency has been a large part of keeping them in the, the championship conversations. First we saw of him was in CCL. It was pretty clear from moment one with Jao Paulo and MLS that he was going to be a presence both within the team, emotionally, calmness, tactical awareness, uh, but also just quality-wise. He, yeah. he's, he's nasty. He's mean. He's super clean on the ball. He wears the all blacks on his feet, <laughs> so you know he's about to mess you up. Like it, it it's just he's he's a wonderful player. So thankful he's gotten to this league. I like what he does with for Ladero too, because uh, and we haven't gotten to see it as much as as we would like. But uh, I mean, it's kind of ironic because Ladero played provider for Jao Paulo in this goal, although uh, there was still a lot left to do on Jao Paulo's part. But I think even as far as there was a play earlier in the match where he kind of just hits that first time. Uh, ball that gets dropped off to him and swings it um, kind of in behind the back line that Ladero hits and I think um, you know doesn't score but goes for a, a corner kick but I just think he when we've seen Seattle sometimes not struggle so much but Ladero's had to come back and get on the ball a lot um, and drop deep into the midfield and I just think with Shao Paulo and his range of passing um, it kind of takes some of that onus off of him to get in more advanced positions and get more connected to um, Jordan Morris and Rui Diaz and some of the other players as well. So, um, yeah, he's he's been incredible. And even just this week, obviously, amazing goal, but just his ability to kind of find – when he scores goals, they're just absolute screamers. The way he strikes the ball has been uh, incredible over the, over the last year or so. It's been like four or five of them. Um, so, And this one's okay, not easy because it's, it's coming across his body. Yeah, it's more than a trend at this point. All right, Seattle, NYCFC, 10 p.m. Eastern, FS2, 2DN, live watch along on YouTube uh, with us. Doyle, give us the sort of early tactical preview uh, of this match. Is Seattle, we know they're, they're super comfortable playing on the break. Like they, they will happily sit deep, concede 60% possession, and and you know would love to, to play that way against just about anybody. And and the way NYCFC approach games kind of plays into Seattle's hands in that regard, because like NYCFC, they more than maybe anybody else in the league, they want the ball. They they want to use the ball. They will come upfield against just about anybody. They will leave space in behind on the counter, um, even on the road. And like Seattle are not going to feel any pressure at all to come out there and, and carry play, even if they, they line up. It, in this one with, with Rushnak as an eight and uh, Ladero in the starting lineup again, they will still be completely happy being uh, a counterattacking team. It feels like this really plays into Seattle's hands, especially when you factor in how good Christian Roldan's been on one wing and how good um, – Jordan Morris can be on the other. He's not back to 100% yet, but he's been dangerous. Like he could add a couple against uh, against Minnesota. He's already got, I think, three goals on the year despite still shaking off the rust. Um, so when you factor in the, the fullback issues with the NYCFC, the amount of space that they're probably going to leave in behind and the, and the way Seattle's always operated on the break, it 
it feels like a really bad matchup for NYCFC right now. Uh, it feels like a really good matchup for the Sounders. Uh, and that probably means that NYCFC is going to walk into Seattle and win 3-0 because that's the way things tend to go with this league and with this competition. One of the things that I just think will be interesting, and Doyle mentioned the, the lack of the counter press or the press for NYCFC, is it, from what it looked like against uh, Minnesota this week because it was the first time we've really seen Roos Nakshaw Palo deep, was Ro- Alex Roldan's going to get really high on the builds and Jao Paulo drops all the way in. And so I'm curious just to see, I think part of that is to protect, um, I'm about to butcher his last name, Jackson Reagan. Yeah, okay. Yep. Then I didn't butcher it. I shouldn't have said that. Part of that, I think, is to protect him, and part of that is obvious. If you thought you were going to butcher, so by the way, that how how did you think you were going to butcher that All of a sudden, other one? letters started moving in my head. Um, uh, but yeah, okay, so... No. So I think part of that's to protect him, and part of that is obviously Alex Rodon can give you that width and in the attack. So I'm just curious to see when does Tati launch that press? Can he sort of trap Jao Paulo into that area? Can Talis Magno stay high up the field and either affect the way Alex Rodon spaces, or can he create chances out of that? And it'll be interesting to me um, to see how that left side operates because, as Doyle mentioned, the right side, it felt... Uh, very weak with Acevedo back there. And we don't know totally what health will be and who was sort of being saved for this week. And Chris Gloucester hasn't performed at a high level himself, but I do think Magno and Tati can sort of operate that press on that left side and create chances. And I think it's going to be really fun. This is to me, the two best teams in this league, just from a pure roster soccer standpoint. Uh, And so this is what you want, right? There's a semifinal, a big moment, um, and I think you saw from this weekend, even though both teams played strong teams, there's an eye to it was building towards this. Uh, and I think this is going to be a pretty special moment. Kaylin, uh, we have Paul hitting us up saying between Seattle and NYCFC, which squad do you feel is more world, world club world cup ready, which is definitely <laughs> putting the car before the horse here. Uh, who, who is, uh, who would you like to see get through to the final? And uh, and have the best possible chance of making history. Who do you think that team would be? I love that we're like, guys, don't just heart the free space is you know disappointment and cautious pe- <laughs> pessimism, and we get but like that two teams in this game. We get there two teams no in the space. semi, and we're just like, we're like, all right, Club World Cup, what are we doing, guys? Where have you never going? been here before? <laughs> this is the. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I mean, I think either T. Te- I mean, either team. I think would be and this sounds like a political answer, but I really do think like either team would be uh, well suited to this. Um, Maybe in different ways. I think I'd be curious to know what the age differential is like average age. I've been so caught up on this with like the U S national team looking towards the world cup, but I would imagine the Sounders are a bit older. Um, So I I don't know. I, I think the Sounders for me, when you look at the consistency of that franchise over time, um, feel a little bit, maybe better suited towards, uh, handling a tournament like that. But um, there's also some question marks about Tati and whether he would be there or not, which I think drastically changes the picture for NYCFC as far as what that would look like at a Club World Cup. And it just also just speaks maybe a little bit to the profile of NYCFC and how they're sort of set up a little bit differently um, within that global framework where players may come and go a little bit more often. And we've seen that kind of be tricky at times in uh, just for Champions League in MLS where roster turnover changes things and you don't get the same team necessarily when you actually go to that tournament. So I'd probably lean towards the the Sounders as far as uh, that goes with their experience, and um, yeah, I think they would. I think they'd be able to do quite well. But I'd be intrigued to see. I mean, obviously, no one's going to complain. <laughs> They'd both be amazing. But um, and I think both would give themselves a good chance in the final. Um, I think. So, yeah. I think just the proper ETR thing to do would be. So obviously, CCL final. I think second leg is May fifth. The CAF final Champions League second leg is May 29th. So if an MLS team wins it, I think we should probably be on the ground for the um, Confederation of African Football's Champions League final, just so we can, like, get to know these opponents and really make yeah, a decision. I completely so. agree with you. Uh, you know, speaking of cart before the horse, I'm still trying nice. to get us locked in to go to either of these final legs. Like, we, uh, we need I to I already be, got my Raja Casablanca guy on, uh, on speed dial, so let me uh, know. Nice. 
All right, 401-206-0MLS, extratimeinmlssoccer.com. It's been a fun week five review so far in the mail. we uh, Sorry, Tom, we got to ignore your umbrella or raincoat uh, comment here. I mean, obviously, it depends on the weather and the distance you are from wherever your destination is, Tom. That, that's obvious for anybody who has experienced rain before. But World Cup draw reaction. Uh, nothing deep here. We have Sean Hardgrove saying, please build your ideal U.S. England Black Friday leftover plate. I know you're passionate about these things, Dave. Uh, Thanksgiving leftovers, Black Friday, uh, U.S. Yeah. England. I don't, I don't. Talk, I'm not a shopper, so I don't call it Black Friday. I call it the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, but my dream meal on that is that the question? So I like yeah, to do yeah. the san. Yeah, you're yeah. left. I like to do the sandwich with everything on it. Obviously, it's got to be rye bread. I like to go to Streisel's Bakery, and then I like to put the the cranberry on one slice of bread, and then I put the mashed potatoes like a sauce on the other side. And then I put stuffing on the sandwich. That's key to me. And being a New York Jew that I am, you throw a little coleslaw in as well because coleslaw makes any sandwich better. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, to get the toxicity out of the way, Mr. Stuff and other things, is it a failure and potential coach firing if the U.S. don't get out of the group <laughs> stages in Qatar? Just oh wanted to, God. like, <laughs> just so we could have that on the record and then just breeze past the, you know, get the – Burn a little sage here can, in the ETR, can, in the ETR virtual studios. Can I just say, in, uh, I think there's a conversation we're going to have about both the U.S. and Canada a lot. Um, I will say, I, I don't think that a coach should follow another cycle. I think that there is there is a, a shelf life to this. This was obviously a huge part, I think, of what happened around Jurgen Klinsmann. Um, Bob Bradley as well. And U.S. soccer was always... You're saying no matter what the results are, like even if we go to the quarterfinals or semifinals yeah i don't i don't your your decision tomorrow or your decision on december 19th has to be is greg berhalter your manager for the 2026 world cup and if not then you give the cycle to the next person and if that's the case which i think to ask someone one to do the job for seven years and two for players to listen to the same person is tough so yeah that's where i stand on all of it uh, all right. Unless you're let's, Hugo uh, Perez, that guy should be coach thoughts. of El Salvador for as long as he wants. Let's uh, just quick thoughts on on the draw. I mean, people probably watch the watch along and they all have their thoughts. We haven't given ours, uh, and Andres says we have to leave now. So, uh, are you happy? Excited? How do you feel about the World Cup coming up, Doyle? Uh, I'm excited for it. I think every team in the group, and in, that includes Ukraine, Scotland, or Wales, whichever one, like probably are, are, are pretty happy with the draw. There's nobody who sh I think will go into this feeling like, oh, this is overwhelming. We have no path out. Um, I, I'm thrilled for the, the England game because that has a chance to be a spectacle and like a, a real sort of benchmark moment for the U.S. national team, not just on the field, but like sort of in popular culture in the, in the U.S. Um, God, the, I, the, the non-trolling from you on that matchup is, oh, God, I cannot wait. We get, we get like seven more months of this lead oh, up too between God, Doyle the content. and uh, the Brits. It's amazing. <laughs> Any, it's like, anyway, um, you know, they, they, they're, they're a small island nation who have traditionally been no hopers in, in the World Cup. So um, it'll be fun to see a, a little, and people probably don't know much about that team. We'll be educating <laughs> you on <laughs> on this English <laughs> national team um, throughout the, the rest of the year. I, I think every I think every team in this group is probably pretty satisfied with the draw that they got. I think that the U.S. should, uh, like, the, the fan base is completely right to expect them to advance out of this group. Completely right to expect them to advance out of this. And to answer the, the previous question, like, no, if, if they don't advance, then Burhalter should not be back. It's just like, and I think, you know, David has a, a good point with, um, you know, more often than not, certainly in U.S. history, bringing a manager back for a second cycle has, has backfired. It wasn't the right choice for Bora. It wasn't the right, well, it was maybe the right yeah. choice for Bruce in 2006. It probably wasn't the right choice for Bob. It certainly wasn't the right choice for Jurgen. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it, you got to be able to learn from history. That said, if the U.S. play up to their potential and they reach the quarterfinals or even, you know, make a run beyond that, of course he's going to be back. So, and, you know, that's the way it should work, right? Like, if you if you achieve something with a team, you're not going to get fired. Um, but there is going to be way too much time to talk about all this stuff. I think 
all U.S. fans should be pretty happy with the group. I think Canada fans should be happy with their group. Um, you know, Belgium and Croatia are two really good teams, both semifinalists last time, both a little bit older. Um, neither at their pinnacle anymore. Defensively, both are a little bit suspect. Uh, I, I think, I think everybody up there, like I, I don't think they should be expecting to get out of the group. But I think you should expect this Canada team to give to give Belgium hell. They you should expect them to give Croatia hell. Um, it's it's like it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Finishes off, Kalen. You have any thoughts? I wanted to go to Goss. Didn't you have something on um, the San Antonio Spurs? Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, I re- I recall <laughs> this. I got to find the quote, but I'm pretty sure Ga- uh, Gareth Southgate. That's his first name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like it's like a it's like yeah, Garrett yeah, with a sure. th. I sorry. I my pronunciations are tough. I don't speak. Uh, I don't speak that language, <laughs> yeah, so I'm still yeah. learning. Re- Reagan, <laughs> yeah, Ra- for sure. Reagan, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, is it is it pronounced Hordano? Heard Her- uh, Henderson. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure Boy, going into the last is... World Cup, there was a piece that came out that Gareth Southgate either went to San Antonio to study their offense and their out of bounds plays to learn about set pieces, or he just had his team doing it um, remotely to sort of learn about how to set up set pieces, which if you remember, I think in the group stage of the last world cup, they scored one non set piece goal. Everything else was on a set piece. Um, And so my point is, is Greg Popovich really the one managing the English national team. And if that's true, you got to feel like a former Air Force guy, former USA coach. He's got that inside track, and now it all comes back around for the U.S. So that's what I'm excited about. But watching the draw, you just see the flags pop up in the pots, and you look at Ghana, Uruguay, and uh, I don't know, somehow they drew the same group twice in a World Cup where it's Denmark, France, and either Australia or Peru, which is bizarre. But all of these things, uh, I don't know, it just struck a chord for me that it's real. And it's exciting, and it's going to be fun. And I agree with Doyle. Canadian fans should have expectations. Mexico fans should have expectations. So should U.S. fans. And that's sort of all you can ask for going into a tournament like this. I'm praying, although I'd love for the best for Ukraine and their national team, that Scotland or Wales makes the group because that will become the number one story. And it will be seven, eight, nine, four. I don't know when the game will be played months of coverage about that. And then the U.S. can just sneak in right at the end. I just want to say, look, Gareth, you might have pop on your side, but Anthony Hudson went to study with Bielsa, so <laughs> we raise you that. We raise you that on our bench. All right, that's it for us. If you have any thoughts, let us know. We'll be on uh, live on YouTube on Wednesday night during this game at 10 p.m. Eastern between the Sounders and NYCFC to figure out who is going to go to the CONCACAF Champions League final. Back on Thursday with Chuck to uh, preview the weekend, uh, and we hope you have a great week. Adios. <laughs> congratulations you made it through more than an hour of extra time that means you love the show and if you love the show you probably want more episodes click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the mls youtube channel thanks for following along